Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever it, uh, wherever you might be. Uh, welcome to ITIF's uh, Center for Clean Energy Innovation webinar called Mission Critical, Accelerating Innovation at COP27. Uh, my name is David Hart. I'm a senior fellow at ITIF and a professor at George Mason University's Shar School. Uh, until very recently, I was the director of the ITIF Center, but it's now my pleasure to welcome Ed Ryder, the new director of the center. Uh, Ed comes to ITIF from the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, where he was the director of the industrial program. And he's ideally suited to take over the center, and I'm really thrilled that he's on board. And I will turn it over to him uh, to introduce our moderator for today. Uh, welcome, Ed, and thank you for joining the team. Uh, thank you, David. It's my pleasure to be here, and I look forward to uh, building on the foundation that you and uh, the team at ITIF have established. Uh, with that, I'm just going to uh, hand it over to Nikki, who is our moderator for today. Hi, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Nikki. I'm the chief editor for Nature Energy. And I'm going to be the moderator for today. Uh, so welcome, everybody, to this discussion session where, as, as David said, we're going to be talking about uh, accelerating clean energy innovation at COP27. The impetus behind this webinar is a special issue that uh, was published in Nature Energy that was designed to feed into the Global Clean Energy Action Forum in Pittsburgh earlier this year in September. So all of the speakers and participants today are authors of papers that, that formed that issue where we were thinking about how to move from the last COP to Pittsburgh. And now we'll be looking at where we go from there as we, as we look to COP next month. Um, so I'm going to, today we're going to be joined by, well, David Hart will be our first speaker. Then we're going to hear from uh, Kelly Sims Gallagher from the Fletcher School at Tufts University. And after that, Ambush Sagar from IIT Delhi. And then we'll be joined by three other panelists, uh, Hoyu Chong, also of ITIF, Amy Myers-Jaffe and Zdenka Mislakova, also both from the Fletcher School. Um, we'll hear three talks to start with. Uh, before the panelists come back, and then we'll have hopefully plenty of time for questions. So to make the most of that, I'm not going to delay any further, and I will introduce David back to the screen so that he can give us his presentation. So David, please. Thanks, Nikki. And um, let me just say again, thanks to you for uh, putting together the forum, and it's a real pleasure to be part of this group of authors. So my contribution to the Nature Energy for, for, uh, Forum was co-authored with Hoyu Chung, uh, my colleague here at ITIF, and it's entitled Glasgow to Pittsburgh. And as Nikki mentioned, that refers to the clean energy ministerial that was held in September. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to summarize the main points in that piece and then roll forward a little bit to talk about uh, both what happened at Pittsburgh and what might happen uh, next at the COP. Uh, next slide, please. So first, uh, why should we care about innovation um, and why should it be uh, on the minds of the world at uh, Sharm El Sheikh at the COP uh, coming up. Uh, I assume I'm preaching to the choir here, so I'm not going to belabor the point. Uh, this graphic from the International Energy Agency's net zero by 2050 scenario really tells the story. Uh, what it shows is that more than half of the emissions reductions needed to achieve that ambitious scenario, that is net zero by 2050, those emissions reductions would come from technologies that are not yet on the market. And another large chunk comes from technologies that are not mature and must continue to improve. Of course, this isn't a prediction. No doubt the future will be very different from what the IEA's model shows, but it is representative, I believe, of all the pathways. There's no way we can get to net zero without a lot more innovation. It is truly an imperative. Uh, next slide, please. So where will this innovation come from? Of course, the answer to that question is very complicated as the rest of our discussion today will show. But certainly one part of the answer is public spending on research development and demonstration. Uh, in Paris, at the time of the signing of the Climate Accord, the leaders of the world's major economies also promised to double their spending on energy research development and demonstration. This was the uh, Mission Innovation Initiative, and I'm sure others here will also speak of it. Uh, and by our reckoning, uh, these countries fell short of that promise, pretty far short, about $50 billion worth in total between 2015 and 2020. Spending did go up, that's the bottom line on the graph. Uh, so you can see the bottom line has a positive slope, but not as much as promised, that's the top line in the graph. So the, the area in between is that $50 billion uh, shortfall. 
So if we roll forward to Pittsburgh, uh, one of the big announcements there was $94 billion in commitments to support demonstration projects. That's the second D in our D&D. And I um, was really enthusiastic, excited to hear about uh, those commitments because I think demonstration is one of the weakest links in the global energy innovation system. And $94 billion is a big, uh, a big showing. Uh, it's more than the $90 billion that the IEA calculated would be needed to fulfill their 2050 scenario. Um, and they had hoped that that would be raised by 2026. It's only 2022 now. So we're ahead of schedule on that. But of course, these are just commitments. And the question is, um, will the nations of the world follow through on it? Will they spend the money productively? Will it lead to the solutions being ready to be deployed in the 2030s and 2040s, which is really why we need these demonstrations now? So what I'm looking for at the COP and beyond is the action plan. What's going to happen next with that $94 billion and more generally with uh, our D&D spending by the public sector? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second big point in our article was that the global innovation portfolio isn't necessarily well matched to the emissions challenges that we need to solve. Although admittedly, it's hard to measure this. And, and uh, I think we can have an argument over exactly what the distribution should be. And I think Hoyu will speak a little bit more to this point in the discussion. Uh, our illustrative data on this uh, is from the Clean Tech Group's venture capital database. So that's what you see on the right side of this um, uh, slide. Between 2015 and 2020, this indicator was dominated by electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are the gray bars, the gray portions of the bars on these uh, slides for each year. So it's great, very excited that EVs are getting funded, but we need a whole lot of other technologies to be recipients of this kind of funding as well. Uh, here too, there was good news in Pittsburgh. The public sector is seeking to jumpstart a number of other technologies like hydrogen, uh, sustainable aviation uh, fuels, uh, carbon dioxide removal. So that's coming from the, from the public side. And now I think what we're looking for is the private sector sort of crowd in behind that. So if we think of public sector investment as a crowding in force, uh, we're looking for the private sector to crowd in after. Um, and then next slide, please. And then the third point that we made was about international competition and cooperation. Uh, both of these have an important role to play in the innovation process. And the question that we ask in our article is whether there's the proper balance right now. Obviously, there's been a swing toward greater competition due, due to security concerns as well as economic concerns. Um, and this has been manifested in efforts by the U.S. and the EU and probably other countries to bring the supply chains for uh, clean energy products home. Uh, where we think this shift may create particular risk is in the energy intensive trade exposed industries, the so-called so EITE industries. Uh, these are major industrial emitters like uh, metals industries and chemicals industries. Generally speaking, solutions for these uh, sectors to get them to net zero are not really ready for the market. And getting these solutions to the point where they are market ready is going to require some pretty big investments, um, especially in demonstration projects, infrastructure, and so on. And there might be really be some benefit from sharing these investments, or at least the knowledge that comes from uh, those investments to be cooperatively uh, shared globally. Now, this is not a topic that got a lot of attention into Pittsburgh. And as we look to the, uh, the COP27, you know, I'm really looking at the private sector commitments to shed some light on this. Um, it's global companies, I think, that may have the strongest interest in facilitating cooperation. Uh, the public uh, sectors, you know, are, are somewhat at odds. So I think that's something to watch as we go towards Egypt. Um, and with that, I'll yield back the balance of my time and um, look to the other presenters. Thanks and happy to hear from anybody uh, on this uh, points. I'm muting myself. I think I'm next. I'm Kelly Sims Gallagher. I am a professor of energy and environmental policy and academic dean at the Fletcher School. And um, uh, I published this paper together with Stanka Mislakova and Amy Jaffe, um, both of which uh, work together with me in the Climate Policy Lab. And our focus uh, was on shielding and expanding mission innovation. And so going to the next slide, as we think about going from how this institution of mission innovation can help catalyze um, effort and investments in clean energy innovation, and, and we head into COP27, I think we go into 
this new round of negotiations facing this trilemma of challenges, um, most of which are, are, at least two of which are <laughs> resulting from these geopolitical tensions due to Putin's war in Ukraine. Uh, that the first is, uh, of course, most countries, I think it's fair to say, maybe all countries have increased concern about global energy security. There's a lot of debate about the role of gas um, in addressing energy security, but also development imperatives. Um, and everybody has been facing volatile energy prices. Um, in fact, we've seen you know, crude oil prices started the year at $86 a barrel, shot up to $122 a barrel in June, fell back down to $89 per barrel this month. And we likewise are seeing very significant volatility in gas prices. And of course, those are more regionally differentiated. Um, but gas prices, particularly LNG prices, have really uh, soared. Um, and so this creates uncertainty, it contributes to these inflationary pressures and, um, and creates anxiety about energy security. Um, and meanwhile, as a result of these same pressures, we're seeing an uptick in energy poverty rates um, around the world. Uh, a recent report from the International Energy Agency um, asserted that 4% more Africans are living without electricity at all. In other words, they've fallen back from having electricity access compared with 2019. Um, and even here in the United States, uh, the latest data show that 20 million Americans have fallen behind on electricity prices, or, uh, electricity bills this year um, due to rising costs. And then, of course, and this uh, relates most strongly to the COP, the global emissions are still rising. Um, and uh, especially for those countries that have had to turn back to coal due to uh, the war in Ukraine, um, we're seeing you know, an uptick in um, emissions, even in countries that had already peaked and begun a, a steep decline in emissions reductions. Next slide, please. So how can these two uh, institutions, I think we can call them, uh, help address these problems? Um, what we called for in our commentary or perspective was um, shielding and expanding the types of activities that are underway in mission innovation uh, to bas basically protect um, and then enhance our efforts um, around energy technology innovation. So um, there's been an, a number of announcements of new missions within the context of mission innovation. Um, and, um, and to give you one example, the net zero industry mission was announced um, in Pittsburgh uh, and includes an, an interesting set of countries, Australia, Austria, Canada, China, European Commission, Finland, Germany, Korea, and the UK. Um, and it called for, uh, among other things, um, achieving at least 50 large-scale demonstration projects uh, by 2030 for hard-to-abate industries like steel, cement, and chemicals. Um, but there are uh, a number of other missions related to clean hydrogen, zero emission shipping, CO2 removal, renewable energy, uh, grid integration, and more. Uh, and, and this sort of endeavor, of course, should be protected. And then we need to make sure that um, the commitments that have been made are honored and there needs to be some accountability around those. As David just mentioned, I, I think everybody recognizes that it's extremely important to do uh, demonstration projects. And because they tend to be expensive pre-commercial demonstration projects, um, it makes a lot of sense to try to do multinational arrangements, to do cost sharing arrangements. And, and we particularly call for um, setting up international public-private partnerships that specifically include state-owned enterprises um, because there's a lot of resource available in the state-owned enterprises. And uh, as I'll show in a moment, 
Uh, we believe that the state-owned enterprises are lagging in this um, energy, clean energy technology transition. And finally, of course, um, resource mobilization is going to continue to be very important, um, both public and private. And I think as many people remember from Paris, when Mission Innovation was established, there was a commitment to double um, public dollars for uh, energy research development and demonstration. And then this companion organization, Great Breakthrough Energy, was established to try to catalyze and mobilize private capital. Next slide. So just to give you a sense of, of how we're doing against those um, against those targets uh, of doubling um, since 2015. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, the United States um, uh, spending um, uh, since 2015. Um, and you can see there has been a significant increase. This is as reported to the International Energy Agency. Um, and then on the right-hand side, China um, and uh, in this case, it's as reported to Mission Innovation. Um, and you can see all, likewise that there was at least initially up through 2018, a significant uh, increase in spending for the Chinese. There's no data for um, 2020 and 2021. Next slide. Uh, overall, uh, as you look at um, public energy R&D &D expenditures, um, I'm seeing that the colors have changed in my slides. Um, the uh, what what we're showing here is um, in 2018. That's the last year for which we have complete data overall. Uh, there was a 38% increase between 2015 and 2018 um, in the total public expenditures. On the right hand side, this is our best guess or our best estimate for 2020 although we're missing um, data for both India and China, it's incomplete data. Um, uh, for China, we're missing the renewable energy data. And for India, we're expecting um, additional fossil fuel data related to um, uh, the oil and gas industry. Uh, so this depiction is slightly skewed um, because both countries are more likely to be uh, higher ranked in terms of total expenditures. Um, and, and again, uh, hopefully you can see this on the graph. I realize it's, it's kind of hard to read. Uh, some of the uh, countries have actually declined again, um, perhaps in the face of all of the economic pressures, but we're seeing some countries are, are continuing to increase um, their expenditures. Now these data do not include state-owned enterprise spending, uh, but if we go to the next slide, it just gives you a sense here of, uh, and this is coming from a, a forthcoming paper uh, led by Amy Jaffe um, on state-owned enterprise R&D &D expenditure and the role of these state-owned enterprises. Um, and here you can see that um, a kind of mixed picture uh, significant increases uh, in state-owned enterprise expenditure from PetroChina, um, but a decline, uh, for example, from Petrobras. And what we know so far is that these, uh, these investments are still largely um, being devoted to fossil fuel-related technologies. Uh, so it does not appear so far that most of the state-owned enterprise expenditure is um, consistent or Paris aligned, um, but consistent with, with a low carbon transition. Next slide. So as we proceed from mission innovation to the COP, um, I think we should recognize that mission innovation is this uh, unique institution among our international energy institutions um, because it has a mixed membership. Uh, it includes economic powerhouses like Europe, the US, China, Japan, India, Korea, uh, but also smaller countries that want to be able to combine forces um, and participate in, in the innovation process uh, for clean energy like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Chile. 
I think it's also notable Russia is not a member. And so some of the problems de kind of bedeviling uh, the G20 process right now uh, are not, do not create challenges for this institution. Um, so I think clearly what we need to do now is match the technological process of progress that's being made through mission innovation with progress at the COP on climate finance to demonstrate and deploy these low carbon uh, technologies. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. I guess I'm next. So uh, <clears throat> good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, and uh, I am Ambud Sagar from the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. And it's a pleasure to be part of this discussion and this group on indeed a very important topic, that of uh, accelerating clean energy innovation. Uh, while this goal of accelerating clean energy innovation is indeed a very laudable and desirable goal. I wanted to step back and take the conversation in a somewhat different direction and focus my remarks on two related issues that are accelerating innovation for what and accelerating innovation how. And I want to reflect on these issues from the vantage point of developing countries. So I realize that my talk is going to be somewhat different from the ones that my colleagues gave but I hope that uh, as I continue, you will see that uh, there is uh, a reason to think about the kind of issues that I am talking about, uh, not because we are interested only in climate issues, but uh, from a developing country perspective, also sustainable development uh, challenges. Broadly speaking, uh, there are two characteristics of developing countries that I want to kind of highlight here that have a particular bearing on how they engage with clean energy innovation and vice versa. First, developing countries are faced with significant developmental challenges, the nature of which varies across these countries, uh, including the need for significant economic development, addressing local environmental and health imperatives, and enhancing access to clean energy services. The last of these challenges, enhancing access to clean energy services, is particularly key for reasons I will elucidate later. But at this time, the point I want to highlight is that having to address clean energy and developmental challenges simultaneously, as developing countries have to do, adds a significant layer of complexity to uh, these countries' efforts at clean energy uh, transitions. Secondly, the human and institutional capabilities to manage the energy and sustainable development transformations in these countries generally are not commensurate with the magnitude and complexity of the task at hand. This is particularly important as effective engagement with these transformations depends very much on the social, economic, political, and institutional context, which necessarily varies across these countries. Since there is no one size fits all formula for managing these transformations, the need for local capacity, again, a topic I'll come back to in a second, the need for local capacity to suitably guide, support, and implement these trans transformations is critical. So I'm going to come back first to the issue of access to clean energy. Turns out this is a major and surprisingly and shamefully persistent problem. According to the International Energy Agency, around 770 million people, mostly in Africa and Asia, do not have access to uh, electricity. The situation with clean cooking energy is even more dire. More than two and a half billion people rely on polluting forms of energy for their cooking needs. Their continued reliance on polluting fuels, biomass, coal, and kerosene is a major contributor to household air pollution, which is estimated to be responsible for about two and a half million premature mortalities annually, and is also estimated to contribute over a fifth of the ambient air pollution in many developing countries. And as it turns out, eliminating these polluting fuels is also good for the climate, since many of their products of incomplete combustion are greenhouse gases. Now, you might be wondering, what does this have to do with clean energy uh, innovation? Well, the ongoing clean energy uh, technology revolution 
particularly the significant and ongoing advances in renewable energies, renewables and energy storage could actually help greatly advance the development and implementation of low cost and robust uh, electricity and clean cooking systems for rural and remote areas, only if we turned our attention to them. The mission innovation platform here could play a critical role. For example, by marshalling a combination of instruments such as targeted R&D, innovation prizes, and advanced market commitments to drive a clean energy access revolution. And of course, the mission innovation countries certainly have the wherewithal to do so. I would in fact contend that efforts to, the accelerate, efforts to accelerate clean energy innovation would be fundamentally problematic and unjust if they were not paying attention to issues such as clean energy access. And the reality is at this point, they really are not. Coming to the issue of how to accelerate uh, clean energy innovation, I suggest that guiding and managing the innovation process is key for effective outcomes, especially if one is trying to advance clean energy and sustainable development simultaneously. But managing the innovation process requires different kinds of capacity. This includes framing the issue, which involves clarifying objectives and strategies for innovation. It includes de designing implementation pathways for clean energy technologies, which involves developing and choosing amongst options, whether it's technologies, business models, and transition pathways, uh, taking into account various stages of the technology cycle. It includes effective implementation of these pathways, which involves marshalling actors, networks, and resources relevant to specific technologies and coordinating actions across stages of the technology cycle. And it includes learning from systematic assessment and analysis of experiences. One might well argue that unless de uh, developing countries have the appropriate capacities in place, the design and implementation of their national innovation pathways may lack full effectiveness, thereby undermining the ultimate objective of most of our climate discussions, which is mitigation at a scale and speed necessary to avoid dangerous climate change. As it turns out though, capacity development has received the short shift in the clean energy innovation arena, with most of the focus being on developing new and improved technologies, reducing prices or facilitating rapid deployment, and in fact, even mission innovation very much has uh, focused on these kinds of issues. And it's not surprising because these issues are actually very central to addressing the climate challenge. Uh, in fact, for anyone who's familiar with the global climate policy discussions, this lack of focus on capacity will not come as a surprise. Capacity building, the third means of implementation, is the mostly ignored cousin of the other two more popular means of implementation, technology and finance, that get pretty much all the attention. But I would contend that capacity, the capacity issue lies at the heart of the question of how to accelerate clean energy innovation in a manner that allows developing countries to meet their climate and sustainable development challenges. A capacity development program that includes an emphasis on both better understanding the nuances of capacity needs to support deep decarbonization and helping build such capacity could play a very valuable role here. So, uh, the, turns out the international arena is replete with slogans such as sustainable energy for all or making clean energy affordable, attractive and accessible to all. But going beyond sloganeering and actually connecting clean energy innovation to these goals in a significant manner would be a major step forward indeed. Sadly, but not surprisingly, this didn't happen at Pittsburgh. But I'm hoping the winds will blow in this direction at COP27. As they say, hope springs eternal. And with that, uh, I'll end. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ambuj and Kelly and David for those interesting uh, talks and introductions to the subject. We're now joined by uh, Hoyu, Zdenka and Amy. I think we can just about all squeeze on here. Um, um, I'd like to, first of all, just remind uh, everybody watching that you have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, there is a Slido link, which you should be able to see uh, below the stream. 
please add your questions in uh, and we will try and get around as many of them as we can. Um, otherwise, you're just going to have to hear me asking questions, um, which might be much less interesting. Now, before we do the questions, what I'd like to do is invite the uh, participants, first of all, the pa our panelists, um, if they have any reflections that they'd like to speak to on, on, on what they've heard or, or on anything else um, that they've contributed as part of the special issue we published. Um, so maybe we can begin with or you, if you have anything you'd like to add quickly. Sure. <clears throat> sure, it's my turn now. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, thank you, Nikki. Um, hi, everyone. Good day. My name's Hoi Chang. I'm a senior policy analyst at ITS Center for Clean Energy Innovation. And as David mentioned, one key aspect that I really want to emphasize is the importance of diversification, diversifying the portfolio of investments. So from COP26, we, we've heard several exciting announcements on new initiatives being launched, such as the First Movers Coalition and the new Mission Innovation 2.0, um, both of which aim to address this exact issue. The FMC originally aimed to uh, spur innovation in emerging technologies and launched with just four target sectors in mind, steel, trucking, shipping, and aviation. However, since uh, last year's launch, it had added uh, more sectors that are also very hard to base, such as aluminum and carbon dioxide removal. Not only is FMC diversifying these uh, hard to obey uh, target sectors, the growing list of members also represent increasingly varied industries and countries. For example, at launch, there were just 34 original members and has now uh, since been expanded to 57 members as of September 2022. Some of the newest members include Rio Tinto, which is one of the largest metal and mining companies in the world, and Mitsui OSK Lines, one of the largest shipping companies based in Japan. These target sectors are collectively responsible for 30% of global emissions and are expected to rise to 50% by the mid-century without urgent progress on clean tech innovation. And as um, Kelly touched on, um, the new mission innovation, and to also to piggyback on David's comment on the demonstrations, the $94 billion investments that we heard from a Pittsburgh CEM will translate to a commitment to deliver over 200 demonstration projects in areas such as uh, net zero industries, um, green power future, urban transition, and, and zero emission shipping. These are really great developments. It's really exciting and something to be uh, cheered about. But however, I still feel that a lot more can be done. For, for one, um, companies, private sector um, industries from, from Asia, South America, and Africa are still very much underrepresented in the conversation. And diversifying to additional sectors, um, Chemical, cement, and concrete come into my mind will also be extremely crucial in the upcoming decades. And as some of you in the audience have already known that um, the IEA's new uh, World Energy Outlook report released today that even if countries follow these uh, on their announced pledges, fossil fuel demand will still be about twice as much as the demand called for under the net zero um, by 2050 scenario. Likewise, the UN Environmental Program also stated that the, the updated national determined contributions that the countries have submitted since COP26 will only amount to a reduction of, of about half a gigaton of uh, fossil uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, which means all of these uh, data points and observations speak to me that we need a lot more, um, not only a lot more uh, clean energy, uh, innovations, but also everywhere in every sector. So, and finally, to David's point, electric vehicles have recently dominated the conversations in the private sector venture capital investments. So my hope is that these new developments would crowd in more investments into all of these uh, other sectors and more clean tech verticals, eventually creating markets for these new low carbon technologies. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you, Hoyu. Uh, Zdenka, is there anything you'd quickly like to add? Uh, thank you. Nikki. Thank you, Nikki. And um, hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with this wonderful group. Uh, my name is Denka Mislikova, and I'm from the Climate Policy Lab. I'm a scholar, postdoc scholar there. And I was thinking about what, what really stood out for me in September at the gathering, Mission Innovation Gathering, and reflect briefly on that. 
is um, the missions and how they are designed in a promising way. Because these seven missions that have been announced, um, not now in September, but uh, in Mission Innovation 2.0, they all have concrete goals, they have action plans, and they have roadmaps. And you know, as um, disappointing as it was, at least for me, to learn that Mission Innovation would not track or not commit to doubling the clean RD&D expenditures anymore. Um, the idea that the missions have these plans and then there is a commitment by the IEA and IRENA through the track and review framework to track it is actually promising. For example, the Green Powered Future mission that is committed to the integration of renewables, um, they have designated uh, the specific countries that co-lead this mission. These countries have designated specific institutions and specific people who will be in charge. And then there is the commitment of um, the IENA and IRENA to work with these missions on tracking the progress, right? So um, that really stood out for me and it made me also reflect on the important, um, important role of stakeholders like the IEA and IRENA in the uh, overall process because they really guard and push these efforts that maybe would not otherwise happen. And so also in September, it was um, mentioned that this track and review framework will be an important, um, important uh, effort to, to look for. And um, that, would, that would be one of the efforts I wanted to point out here. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Amy, do you have anything that you'd like to quickly reflect on from, from what well, we've been talking about? Well, let me, uh, I'm gonna, I'll make a short reflection on, on state enterprise, but before I do that, I just wanted to elaborate on uh, Kelly Sims Gallagher's comments about the new energy security situation and the volatility of prices. So I think there is sort of a lack of understanding in general about whether we're in some temporary situation or whether it could be long lasting. So I would say the disruption in crude oil markets um, has been actually smaller than people think it is. Um, there actually has been almost no disruption. We are about to get a disruption probably in about a million barrels a day of Russian oil, but demand is down probably 2 million barrels a day because of recessionary pressure. Um, so again, I wouldn't constitute that as a crisis. Uh, maybe OPEC's making it worse with their own announcements. But again, uh, that market is not as, it's volatile, but it's not based on a giant supply hole. Um, but in the natural gas market, it's much more serious. And um, again, I think there's understanding, but maybe it hasn't sunk in that um, when Russia decided in its ways that it was not going to export certain gas through certain pipelines to Europe, um, that we're talking about a ginormous amount of natural gas. So Europe in 2019 was buying something like 200 billion cubic meters of gas a year from Russia. And uh, now that's probably, you know, in the tens, you know, 20, 30, if that amount. And they have only shifted 15 BCM to China. And there's no capability to shift additional volumes to China. That gas is staying under the ground. And I think that people don't understand that because there's a lot of disinformation about shifting it to China or there's a couple of extra LNG cargoes going from Russia to someplace. But we're talking about a huge amount of gas that's been taken out of the market. And if we add to that the fact that we were in the sort of program of where was the next level of LNG to come from between 2024 and say 2027, there were three major LNG projects that were supposed to come from Russia, Baltic LNG, Arctic 2 LNG, and AUB LNG. And that, that LNG is also now not going to happen, in my opinion, because of both the technology sanctions against technologies and because there's uh, not um, going to be difficulty with finance and also with 
um, customers and also with uh, project uh, partners. And so you're having this giant, giant hole in the global gas market and therefore, when you hear a lot of the rhetoric still uh, coming into the cops uh, about how natural gas needs to be included in Africa or this or that, um, that rhetoric about the role of natural gas is disconnected from the fact that we're having the largest international disruption in natural gas that's ever happened. Um, and so that is the context under which we have this energy security situation that really does propel the need for ramp up of renewables and battery storage and other kinds of uh, storage options to replace that natural gas. Um, and so I just want to contextualize that um, and then elaborate on um, uh, Kelly's points about the state oil and gas companies um, because they are continuing, because they have a role in country, whether that's in a country, you know, like Saudi Arabia, where they're very tied to revenue generation, or in a country like India, where the role is to make sure, or Brazil, to make sure that there's energy security inside the country for its oil and gas needs. Um, you know, you have this problem that billions and billions of dollars of spending is being spent on drilling technology um, for R&D, which we know has sort of a decadal impact. So by the time those new drilling technologies might be useful in oil and gas, uh, we should be retiring that oil and gas in the first place, and there won't be as much demand. And so that is really literally just wasted money. And so, you know, how do we get countries um, to spend effectively, which I think uh, Abuj was really referring to, right? When we talk about their effective spending, that's partly, I think, through these missions that Zdenka has mentioned and through really well thought through uh, demonstrations, um, but also uh, getting state enterprise to stop rowing against the trend and trying to protect itself and getting them to participate um, in these missions, I think is something that needs to be a high priority. That's really great, thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, again, a quick reminder that um, people, you can post your questions if you have questions on anything, now including what you've heard from the, the, the panelists. Um, I'm gonna start with the, with the Q&A now, and I'm gonna begin with one of the audience questions. So um, the first one, is uh, regarding the need to engage with uh, state-owned enterprises across borders, how do you manage concern with IP and the need to protect incentives for private sector R&D? And I suspect this, this also ties in perhaps with some ideas that we've heard a lot more about recently connected with things like technology sovereignty. And as we think about this, the clean energy transition, I, I suspect. But um, Kelly, is that something that you, uh, you, you're, you're happy to answer to begin with? Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I think we can look at a number of different arrangements that have existed in the past uh, that worked effectively um, to be able to bring um, public and private actors together um, without any IP infringement. Uh, so it may be hard to even imagine this today, uh, but not too long ago, the United States and China established a virtual US-China Clean Energy Research Center, the CERC. Um, and it had robust participation around five areas, you know, five kind of clean energy technology domains like green buildings and clean vehicles. Um, and I think part of why it attracted so much private sector participation and co-investment was because there was a, um, a model IP agreement that was established um, that could be adapted, but was the sort of baseline starting point for all participants. And because that uh, IP agreement had been essentially endorsed by and sanctioned by the governments, these two governments, 
Um, private actors felt very comfortable, you know, um, to be explicit, I think American firms felt very comfortable participating in technological exchange with the Chinese um, counterparts and vice versa. The Chinese, you know, uh, felt comfortable engaging because they, they had more confidence that IP would be respected due to these IP arrangements. So I think that was a creative way to do it. That's not, you know, politically possible today. I don't think, uh, with respect to this specific example of the United States and China, um, but I can easily imagine, you know, bringing different um, sets of actors together and using that same kind of arrangement, um, and including state-owned enterprises, by the way, um, because um, I think having that common IP agreement uh, sort of unlocks the participation and incentivizes the participation of all actors. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so if I take another question from the audience now um, in a similar vein, although not, not entirely the same situation. Um, what can what can Mission Innovation do to counter the global trend towards protectionist green industrial policies and facilitate this kind of cooperation, capacity building, and spillovers that 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 you've all been talking about are are essential to this this notion of acceleration of of innovation. Um, I don't know who's uh, if anyone's going to put their hand up or. Uh, Sure, I'll, I can get us started. Maybe others want to jump in. I think a, a big thing that they can do is just narrowing the frame. You know, the these concerns are um, often, you know, not not necessarily rooted in in specifics. And um, I think solving this sector by sector is much more feasible than solving it, you know, in one big gulp. So uh, I think what Mission Innovation and, and, and as think I mentioned. Um, you know, it's moving in this direction to focus on on sectors and vertical problems. And I think that move can really help, uh, you know, focus on where the opportunities are. I don't think they can turn around the trend, um, but I think we can look for, you know, you could say eddies in the stream, ways to push back a little bit. Let me elaborate on that. So, you know, some of the technologies we're talking about, you know, don't have semiconductors in them, um, or they're not vital. And so I think that when you're talking about carbon sequestration technologies, when you're talking probably about advanced hydrogen technologies, um, you know, these are things where there's going to be an advantage if every country can use them. Um, and so I think, you know, picking missions um, that focus on these hard to abate sectors is a good idea because um, there's a benefit to having these demonstration projects that then everybody could use that technology. Um, and then I think beyond that, and we recommended this in our paper, is to think about, you know, where are we going to base an effort and, and who's going to go there? And so uh, it's true if we're trying to do some venture in some country that has import or export restrictions with another country that also needs to collaborate collaborate in that process, uh, that could be problematical. But if the venture was in a third party neutral country and set up in the structure uh, in a way where you're just lending, secunding uh, uh, scientists or engineers to work together um, and there's going to be some sharing, uh, I think that that again gets us out of the out of the problem and you think about um, previous and even continuing collaborations in space uh, where we still have militarization of space. And so, you know, we still manage to do scientific missions in space. So I think one has to look at um, how do I structure demonstration projects or specific uh, uh, breakthrough uh, investment where I'm having researchers from multiple countries work together in a way that uh, gets around this problem of the ownership of the IP where everybody can just agree that uh, for this particular venture demonstration or technology, uh, countries are going to work together. That's a really interesting idea. Thank, thanks, Amy. 
Um, I'd like to turn the attention a little bit now back towards perhaps some of what Ambuj was talking about with another question from the audience. Um, so North-South cooperation is important for global energy innovation and the broader energy transition. Um, are there any examples of how the North can enable global South energy innovations? Well, uh, yes, I mean, actually, there's no doubt. And uh, I, but I think it depends on how you think about uh, innovation. And uh, I mean, I'll give an example. Uh, India has actually had uh, an LED revolution. You know, we've actually implemented a huge number. Of, I, I've lost track of uh, our implementation of LEDs, but uh, it's been an enormously successful uh, implementation. And it's based on technologies that are, in a sense, global technologies. In fact, the reality is the world of technology is global. Uh, one of the questions really becomes, how do you adapt these technologies and modify them to meet local, local conditions and local needs, right? And I think that's where cooperation can play a really, really important role. Uh, rather than think about only, I think there was a question about homegrown technologies. And I think that uh, there may be some case of homegrown technologies, but in today's world, it really is the ability to pick knowledge and components from different parts of the world and be able to put together systems that are useful for your own for your own context. Um, so I think I think to me that is the way probably to to go um, and think about that. Uh, and I think what's been good about mission innovation in that context actually is that it does bring developing countries and uh, industrialized countries, the north and the south, together on a platform that goes beyond the traditional cooperation, which was really purely on R and D, and going beyond R and D to things like demonstration. I think is is uh, expanding the the ways in which these countries can countries can collaborate. And if I might just actually then add on to that this uh, related question about capacity building and the role of mission innovation, I think to me that is the next step in thinking about how do we how do we work across borders and build cooperative arrangements between the north and the south to facilitate uh, energy innovation and energy transformation in the south. Uh, I, you know, things like capacity building, uh, if entities like the Mission Innovation or other entities were to take it up, uh, I think it would greatly, as I, as I even try to point out in my remarks, I think it would be extremely helpful. So far, it's not happened that much. The cooperation has been more on the upstream part of the technology cycle, and the focus has mainly been on technology. And I think the cooperation really needs to be thinking ab about innovation more broadly and thinking about the fact that innovation should not only be about climate mitigation, but also thinking about the particular needs of developing countries, such as energy access and sustainable development. Thanks. Zdenka, you're, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, can I just very briefly jump into what Ambush said? Um, I know that might be just like so obvious, but I actually think that uh, uh, so important just creating more space so that the world and others know about what's happening in the global south because uh, from some case studies and field work we have done uh, and i have done uh, through my dissertation work i have noticed how many capable and really innovative companies and maybe very small companies but you know are there and are being formed in some of these countries but uh, we don't know about them enough you know, and they are extremely innovative. They are innovative for their own environment and they can be very innovative also for, for the global north. So just the information, like having a platform that will offer that information, which can then be taken further and everyone can select who will collaborate with whom. No, I think that's an interesting point. We, we, we so often think of these things as being the north, north supporting or, 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 or aiding the south. I guess I'm interested a little bit and we you know cop so so the next cop is is in is in africa it's going to be in egypt um to what extent bridging those two points and um, and zdenka do we have to the opportunity here to help project out some of that innovation and ideas around innovation or, or, or financing or demonstration and deployment from um developing contexts back to the to the developed context and create opportunities where the learning runs the other way. How, how, do, how do we get bring that out of COP? 
Ambuja, any any uh, any thoughts from you? Well, Nikki, I, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I would actually say that maybe uh, if one wants to think about knowledge that flows from the south to the north, uh, it may not necessarily be technical knowledge, but knowledge about how to organize for innovation and how to organize for effective outcomes. So I think, you know, I myself have written some papers on how the Bureau of Energy Efficiency in India has been extraordinarily uh, effective in uh, really advancing energy efficiency programs in India. I actually think there's something to be learned uh, by other countries, including in the North, from how those programs are designed, uh, actually with a lot of fairly innovative kind of thinking. And that's not the only one, but I'm, I'm putting that, as, uh, that out as an example. So I think, I think uh, certainly I can imagine that there are ways in which the North could certainly uh, learn even from the South, and the South, Southern countries can learn from each other also. So I, I, I really believe that greater cooperation across borders, and that's what I was talking about, different, not just focusing on the upstream part of the innovation cycle, but think of innovation more broadly, including is thinking about issues such as capacity and organization. I think that broadening of the frame actually allows for much more effective uh, exchange uh, of knowledge uh, in all directions. Thank you. Um, we're rapidly running out of time, so but we can maybe squeeze in a couple of other things. I have a question that perhaps uh, uh, David or Hoy you might be able to to take, um, I, I, because I'm interested in um, the role of failure. We haven't really touched on it here, but we often hear, you know, there's often the discussions of value of the debt of the value of death. We're talking a lot about demonstration, and of course, with demonstrations going to come some degree of failure. How do we need to think about that in the context of rapid transition, rapid acceleration of, of innovation and also deployment. And, 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 and are we comfortable enough with the idea of failure as we look ahead to the, to the, to the coming years and, and money that will be poured into things that are not going to work? Uh, David or Hoyu? Yeah, so I, I think um, it's a challenge for the public sector because governments and, and uh, you know, public officials want to see a return. And I've been trying to make a distinction between good failures and bad failures. Uh, what we want is good failures in the sense that things that we didn't know would go wrong, that go wrong as you scale up and fail fast and fail honestly. So we cut our losses. Um, and I, I, at least looking at the U.S., I think our, our political system doesn't do a great job of distinguishing those two kinds of failures. But that's what I'm hoping for. And you know, all of us, I think, need to keep educating our officials on, on that. Right, and to uh, David's point, so um, if you, some of you might know that recently um, the U.S. Climate Envoy John Kerry had talked about um, the um, that um, risk remains a great hurdle uh, in um, investing in um, energy innovation, but um, but as uh, an example that I always like to say, and David has heard it several times from me, is that um, any sort of uh, investments, any sort of a uh, bold action, inherently there's a uh, there is risk involved. But what we want to what we want to achieve is um, have a good failure so that we can learn from it, and that um, in the layman's sense, uh, when you do investment, investing in uh, let's say an index fund, some some stocks are bound to not do so well, but what we should focus on this uh, broad big picture. How overall are we moving in the right direction? And recently in a conversation on um, talking about the loan programs office, I'm sure the I'm sure they will also agree that um that um making these uh, bolder investments are really needed to to bring the nascent technologies to the market so that everyone can benefit. After all, we miss a hundred percent of the shots that we don't take. Very true. Um, okay, we're about running out of time. So I'm going to bring things to a bit of a close here. I guess we didn't one, one of the one of the stated aims for, for the afternoon uh, or morning or evening, depending where you are, was to talk about how we're going to get to what, what we're going to look for at COP27. So what I'd like to do, if everybody is happy, is it would be great to just hear very quickly if you have like a top priority thing that you think people should be 
focused on at COP27 from an innovation context. I think that would be a really great way for us to wrap up. Uh, so I'm just going to call one at a time. So uh, David, would you like to go first? Yeah, I want to see the balance between opportunity and fear. And if the if the overall vibe is about opportunity, then I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, Ambush? Uh, well, uh, let me separate out what I'm what my I might look for and what I might hope for. Uh, what I would hope for is I think not a surprise, focus on issues like capacity and energy access, and honestly, less focus on dollar terms, the dollar numbers. Kelly? Well, I'm, I'm going to agree and disagree with Ambuj uh, in the same breath, because I think we need to match the recent momentum around um, technology with much more momentum uh, in climate finance and in capacity building efforts. So I would look for that from the COP. And Zdenka? I will also separate it as Ambush did a little. I think um, what I will look for definitely, it's uh, seeing whether some of the missions will announce uh, concrete plans because they did so last year. And what I would hope for is to see um, some new approach to a conversation about uh, the losses and how we actually honor them. Uh, Hoi Yu? Sure. One thing I want to pay attention to is um, what um, commitments are being implemented and how diverse uh, are these commitments that came out of COP26 last year. And um, Amy, to wrap us up. Okay, I have two. Number one, the United States has been the party most prominently protecting its technology. So we need to have a much larger leadership role in fostering collaborations in technologies that are very important for the climate um, and don't conflict with these other little priorities that seem to be uh, on a national security basis. So we need to fence that off and push, push, push uh, for collaborations, including with China, um, would be my opinion. And then the second thing is when we implement these global demonstrations, uh, why not put them in the developing South uh, so that we can build capacity by having uh, scientists and engineers and other workers uh, being trained to participate in the demonstrations in the global South instead of doing all the demonstrations uh, in the global North or inside China. That's wonderful. Thank you all. So, with that, I'm going to call the end to the to the session. I'd like to thank uh, the speakers and the panelists. I'd like to thank everybody for their attention and for the really great questions that came through. If anyone's interested in, in following up on this, you can check out the special issue, which you'll find on the Nature Energy webpage. And uh, then, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll come back again after COP and see if any of these uh, priorities or wishes came true. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much, everybody. And I'll see you again next time. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.